I would say that it wasn't so much that I was seeking really the hearts of spirituality. Uh. I think I was seeking a way of trying to get myself out of the mess that I was in. And when we, I had asked, I asked him the question, I said, do you think that liberation is possible in this lifetime? And he said to me, in this, what we call the Kali Yuga, where the degeneration of the samskaras and the living style, he said he doesn't believe it's possible. We've come across this term. We didn't have it in those days. What we call the flow moment. Yeah, absolutely. Being in the flow. Yeah. And I, th I believe that that's what we were, what you experience when you're on the wave and you're surfing. There was a lot of question and answer time with Charaji, who made himself very available, answered a lot of questions about the practice, etc. And a question by one of the Abiyasis said, um, Charaji, we're going back to France or Germany, and etc. Uh, what sort of company, whose company should we keep once we go back? Woof woof. Welcome to Kanakast. Today I'm speaking to John Smith. John Smith is a long-time heartfulness practitioner and a yoga trainer. He was, in fact, the first heartfulness practitioner or abhyasi in Australia. Thank you so much, John, for taking time out and on your last day here and uh, coming to the Kana studio. It's oh. such a joy to have you here. Thank you, Rudy. It's uh, a joy to be here. It's a joy to be in Kanha and a little bit sad to be thinking that I'm leaving this evening so soon. And what's been the highlight of your trip here so far? <laughs> <laughs> well, the highlight is always to have a chance to meet Daji. That That's is so true. I mean, th that is the highlight. And myself and Daniel were blessed. We got to meet Daji one evening and had some time with him. And, uh, you know, that is just, that sort of completes the experience. We've had some phenomenal personal meditations, group meditations, interactions with other brothers and sisters. And all of that is such a joy. You know, it just, just coming back to meet people again and again and just connecting on that egregore with the heart. Uh, and feeling that that presence within each and every person, each and every uh, brother and sister here. But, you know, to have that little moment with Daji is the sort of, you know, you might like, we, we say sometimes in English, the icing on the cake. Yes, the cherry on the, top. The cherry the on icing. top. The cherry on top, yeah. And, you know, if you don't get that cherry on top, it sort of doesn't feel complete somehow. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, and you, your trip also coincided, you were speaking about Egregor right now, mm -hmm. it coincided with the group of transcendental meditation people who were here, 10,000 for World Peace, they had a program. Yes. This is something very new that, of course, Daji has started to bring everyone together mm. at Ghana. Mm. What was that experience like of having all these people from, a, they do a different form of meditation, but they mm. were here for the, essentially the same cause, which is yes. inner peace and outer peace. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, first of all, I have to recommend or, or sort of give my respects to that group and for what they were aiming to do, mm -hmm. to bring, to come together for that egregore, to bring world peace in, 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 in this world. So that's a, an amazing thing to want to do. And of course, it's very much in alignment with heartfulness practices and, you know, creating world peace and that egregore. Um, but can I take you back many, many, many years, if that's okay, Rudy? Of course, please. Even before I joined Heartfulness Practice? Yes, please. Uh, my very first form of yoga practice was Transcendental Meditation. Wow. Yes. And where was this? This was in Sydney, uh, where I grew up. Um, I was about 19 years of age. And I was you going through that sort of transitional period of trying to find, you know, what, what is my purpose in life? What are, what are my aims? And what was I here for? You know, you start to ask yourself those questions. And, of course, I was with my peers and my peers were maybe not asking those questions. And I was getting influenced with probably with the incorrect influences, like, you know, we're going out to party and seeking pleasures outside. Of course, at that age, at everyone that age, is doing that. You know, that was pretty normal. Yeah. And I just remember one time I sort of wake up, wake up in the morning with a little bit of a hangover from the night before and I sort of asked myself this question, this is not what I'm here for kind of thing. This is not my purpose. There's something that I'm not, I'm not progressing as a person and I needed to find something to give me that transformation mm. or feel that more purpose of, of being here. And fortunately for me, I had two sisters who were practicing TM at the time. And I'll go back a couple of years again, when I was probably about 14, because my sisters had already started practicing TM at that time. 
And I remember coming into their bedroom and seeing a photo of Maharishi. Oh, nice. Yes. So Maharishi was there. His photo was on, on the wall. He had his long hair, his beard. He's, he was still alive at that time, of course. He's a beautiful beard and looked quite elegant. You know, mm, as absolutely. they would, as most the same yesi, uh, you know, you know, meditators would look. But what impressed me probably more so was what was written underneath his photo. And underneath his photo was the wording universal love. Now, as a 14-year-old, I probably wouldn't know what universal love, love really meant. But it somehow put a little seed into my heart. And it sat there and I thought, wow, what a beautiful perspective. What a beautiful thing if we mm. could have that universal love in our life or in, on this planet amongst each other. And just coming back to that egregore about them being here for pretty much building universal love in the, wow. on what they were here for. So I was very impressed with the wording of universal love as a 14-year-old. Wow. And the seed was somehow planted. But it wasn't until uh, f till the age of 19 that I started really wanting to maybe explore uh, spirituality and, and, uh, and find a deeper purpose in my life. And therefore, I started with the transcendental meditation practice. So for me, it's almost like a 360-degree thing that, oh, Daji is now bringing the transcendental, the transcendental meditation group is here practicing TM and the flying techniques, etc. Um, I never did the flying technique. I only did the mantra. Mm -hmm. I, I was introduced to the mantra technique, which I did, and found that a very beneficial practice at the time. Um, being a 19-year-old, I was trying to move away from the negative aspects of what was influencing me. Sure, sure. It gave me a focus to to do something. And, you know, very quickly, things such as, you know, drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes, uh, non-veg food were able to leave me. It just fell away, huh? Just On its fell, own. Just fell away. I mean, I wouldn't say just fell away. There was a little bit of… <laughs> <laughs> Push and pull, a tug of war. <laughs> a tug of war. I wouldn't say a tug of war, you know, but there was a couple of times when I, yeah. I regressed a little bit and, yeah. you know, and a couple of mates, my mates, mates would say, hey, let's go out for a beer or something. And it happened now and again. But overall, my whole focus changed. You know, I'd go to the pub and I'd drink orange juice. Wow. And you're from the land where a beer is pretty much thought of as orange juice. It's it's a soft drink. It is a soft drink for them. And if you're not <laughs> drinking beer, what's the matter with you, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That's so interesting. That's yeah. what, and, and it's good that, that uh, you know, you had that time mm -hmm. after the, the hangover. So hangovers are sometimes helpful. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yes. They certainly are helpful. Yeah. because it's How you respond to the hangover is interesting because, yes. you know. Yeah. Um, uh, for a long time, my only response to a hangover was to have another drink so that I'd get rid of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that doesn't work very well. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. No, and, and there was a couple of times when I did that also. You know, <laughs> you know, get over the hangover, let's go and have another drink, or get, let's go down to the pub and have a, a sure. few beers down at the pub. Sure. Mm. So you mentioned even your sisters were uh, into meditation. Yes. Was this something growing up in your family, that the spiritual search? Does it... Uh, yeah, it's a good question, and it's hard to know, you know what, what led my sisters to get into meditation. Mm. I mean, we come from a Christian background, of course, um, but I would have to say that my parents were quite, um, how would I say it? They were into their faith, mm -hmm. and they wanted us to have a, a belief in God. Sure. Yeah? Sure. That was, I think that was quite important to them, to bring us up in uh, I, I suppose in a way where we had a belief in God and we had a good moral compass mm -hmm. to have our direction in life. When my sisters started meditation, and eventually I started meditation, my parents were quite, they accepted us for doing it, but I don't think they understood why we did it. And I think they were also a little bit disappointed in us that we weren't following Christian faith mm -hmm. in the way that they were following the Christian faith. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And in your in your group there, in your friends and amongst your the people you were hanging out with, was was it common for people to look up meditation and uh, take up meditation, or was it still a very um, uh, you know fringe thing at that time when you started TM? It was quite a fringe thing, and I think with the peers that I was mixing with was totally not in their mind to think about doing some form of meditation or yoga practice. Uh, my sister somehow got involved in it, and mm -hmm. they and we sort of probably thought they were kind of a bit strange at the time <laughs> for doing it. 
Um, but very thankful for me because eventually they led me on to coming into, first of all, Transcendental Meditation, which eventually led me coming into Heartfulness some years later. Lovely. Yes. Lovely. And your peers, how did they take it? Suddenly, there's uh, John is drinking orange juice while everybody's having a, yeah. having a beer at the pub. Yeah. I would have to, I have to take my hat off to them because all of a sudden, John goes from drinking beer, smoking cigarettes, uh, going up for parties and having fun to now someone who's meditating, mm -hmm. not drinking beer, not eating meat anymore, but at the same time, they were still happy to have me there. <laughs> so I was very, I mean, they were, that's what you call a friend. Sure, sure, yeah. Because, I mean, some of them fell away, but I had a couple of friends who even with all my changes that I went through, still stuck with me as being a friend, irrespective to what my, my new uh, focus was in life. Mm. And, you know, there wasn't many of them, but a few of them who stuck by me and accepted me for who I was. You know, it's also a, it's also a danger sometimes when uh, we take up a process like meditation. You know, the initial, initially we are so into it and so enthusiastic mm. that we, we start to judge the others that, uh, you know, we may start to judge our peers that, oh, you guys are drinking, you don't know what you're missing out, you're, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of holier-than-thou attitude yes. and kind of separate yourself from the rest. And the others may feel, oh, he's such a killjoy now, all he does is talk about meditation, he doesn't have fun. Was that ever an issue? Possibly. I mean, it might have been more of an issue from their side mm -hmm. than from my side. Um, I still was able to integrate with some of them quite okay. And as I said to you, I, you know, I was into other things that there were also. So we were into surfing, for instance. So we would be out surfing together. Wow. Uh, and that was something. And, you know, so I don't know if you've done surfing at all. No, never have. Uh, or, but uh, and, and surfing can give you that kind of elated feeling. Which I mean, it's it's basically like a religion, right? Surfers, oh. <laughs> <laughs> they are just out there searching for waves, and it's a whole lifestyle. And it is a lifestyle. Know, I, I I would uh, I have no experience of it, but yeah. what I've seen through popular culture, it's a whole different ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, and there, there, there's this thing, this connection to nature. Absolutely, you, you the connection to the water, the connection even to the sea, the sand, the sun, you, and and the feeling that you're you're sort of connecting to nature on the wave. And when you feel like you've got some mastery of being on that wave and surfing, there's this sort of feeling that you're, it's like, you know, we've come across this term. We didn't have it in those days, what we call the flow moment. Yeah, absolutely. Being in the flow. Yeah. And I, th I believe that that's what, we were what you experience when you're on the wave and you're surfing. And that was my experience. And it was like, wow, wow, this is quite nice. So you carried on with the surfing and... Carried on with the surfing. Uh, however, soon, within maybe about a year of doing transcendental meditation, I then also got into yoga. Oh, uh, nice. As in asana practice. Of course, of yeah? course. Now, once I got into asana practice, my focus moved away from surfing. And I became very dedicated as a yogi sure. into asana practice. Sure. That was the time when I started moving away and shifting away from some of the other peers that I had because I was now doing yoga and I had some very lovely yoga teachers in Sydney and I was like uh, in awe of them, of what, what they were teaching me and giving me as a lifestyle change. And so where did, where did work take? You see, John, I've known you for, uh, for some years, but I have no clue what you do professionally. <laughs> it's, like, it's like we meet uh, as uh, fellow meditators, fellow yep. heartfulness, yes. uh, practicing heartfulness. But I have no idea what you do. So wh wh where did life take you? What, what line of work did you follow? Okay. I, I'm not a very educated person. I'd have to put it that way. I actually left school when I was about 15 years of age. I dropped out of high school. I did not like academia at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got into a trade. Uh, which was kind of uh, kind of what you would do in those days. You'd get into a trade, and I got into the lithographic printing trade. Oh wow! Yeah, so I got into into the lithography trade part of it, and uh, did my trade through there, and worked in that environment, uh, in, in the packaging environment, uh, which I quite enjoyed um, at the time. And then uh, there was a time when I, through my work, uh, and through my changes that I went through in, in yoga practice, that I felt a need to then travel to India 
and just leave everything that I'd done. Wow. So because of the yoga that you'd done and TM you had done, yes. it somehow all came together and you decided you were coming to India. Yeah. And how old were you at that time? I was 24. 24. Yeah. And uh, which year would this be? This would be. That was in 1987. 1987. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Wow. So th where did heartfulness enter the picture then? Where did Sahaj okay. Mark come in? Yeah. Okay. So what brought me about to visit India initially was I had a lovely yoga teacher who was teaching me in Sydney and I was getting a lot of good practice and guidance from him at the time. And then he was leaving to go to Perth, which is on the west coast of Australia. And I felt this sort of void that, oh, what am I, who's going to be my teacher, sure. who's going to be my guide? And so he suggested that I then go to Mysore in India to go and practice with his guru, who was Sri Patabi Joyce. Yes, very famous. Very, very famous. famous. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, one of the students of Krishnamacharya. Absolutely. And his family continues to run the Mysore exactly, yoga yeah. school. And yeah, way, way bigger than what it was when the time when I <laughs> yes, went. Yes, yes. And so that was that was the time when I thought, yes, now was I'm going to go to India to get some yoga guidance, training. Yoga yeah. training. In the back of my mind, I always had this feeling that it's not just yoga as in the yoga practice that I want that I want to find a spiritual master and to find the real way to what we might call enlightenment, whatever you want to call it. But somehow, in, in, and it was more like subtle thing in the back. Like even though I was going to Mysore to study with Batabi Joyce, there was something in the back of my mind that says, I'm going to the land of spirituality. I hope my my deepest hope was that I would find some guidance on the spiritual level with mm. the master. But it was very subtle <laughs> at that time. And uh, so how did you then, um, you, you came and uh, that's, it's a very uh, uh, strenuous program, the Mysore program. Very strenuous. They, I've heard stories about mm. it. It's, it's like, it's, uh, there's no holidays, you just keep working and it's, uh, it's physically very strenuous. Very physically strenuous. Interesting to say that we arrived, I think it was early January, maybe around the 14th or 15th. And in the south, you were talking about there's no holidays. Mm -hmm. I think we arrived and we got the first two days of practice in. And then they did have a holiday. Oh, Pongal or something. Pongal or something oh, okay. like that. Yeah. Four days off. Okay. I was very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I don't want to have four days off. I came here to do yoga practice. But anyway, we had four days off and we sort of moved around we, we we did a few things and you know enjoyed being in india you know uh and then four days later we would come back but then once we came back there was it was a tough a tough grill and the first tough grill was we didn't use yoga mats mm, or oh, it's so on the ground huh? it was cement floor wow with a you know the you know if you, you know when you sit in manapakam you had that green carpet yes 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 the green carpet was very thin green very thin carpet. yeah on a cement floor wow and well, I didn't have a yoga mat at that stage, but some of the others did have. And we were doing things like we are uh, like rolling on our back. Jeez. And so the first within the first few days, I was getting all these terrible sores on my back and I'd have to come to yoga and do this rolling. And <laughs> it was like almost like a, a bit of a nightmare sequence coming in until eventually I did get a proper yoga mat. And yeah, so it was a tough and there was no, you know, Patabi was the person that you're here. I'm here to teach you and I'm going to give you my 100% mm. to get you to mm. what you've come here for. Absolutely. So, so he was dedicated to you he, becoming he was, good. He was dedicated to the the aspirants who were there, mm. you know, full, full 100%. And he pushed you to your limit. And that's what, and you were like within four months, I went from probably being uh, a very average yo yoga practitioner to going into the series two. Wow. That's the, the, the series two is a higher level, slightly high, yeah, higher level. Wow. So you get into wow. more advanced practices. Heads behind the leg, oh, the the yeah, the <laughs> heads behind the leg, hands in Namaste. My heads behind That's my incredible. leg, incredible. Both legs behind the head, uh, wow. Full splits. Oh my, yeah. I have to show you some some photos. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. So you so you completed that entire course, did you? I was there. We we, I, we planned to be for three months. Mm -hmm. There was another. Uh, there was another sister who came with me. She was a friend of mine. She was also a devoted yogi, and we we went there and we, we practiced together. 
she decided to go, to leave after three months. And while we were in India, we both found another passion as well as yoga. I my passion became tabla. Oh wow! So I was never I was I liked music, but for some reason the South Indian music and Carnatic music was something that really appealed to me. And the other sister that I was, she got into dance. Oh, she got into Bhartinatyam. Wow. And I got into tabla. But with Carnatic style tabla. So, uh, yeah, so I learned tabla. Got into a passion of learning music and studying Carnatic. So, you're music. becoming less and less of an Aussie and more and more of an Indian. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, maybe there must have been some past samskaras, I think, or something there that led me back into, you know. Wow. Wow. Interesting. So, where did Sahaj Mark feature then with tabla and yoga and how do you end up with Sahaj Okay, Mark? How, how do I end up with Sahaj Mark? It's a good question. Um, after, on every, I think it was every Saturday afternoon, we'd have a kind of philosophy session okay. with, with, with Patabi Joyce. And he would go into depths of talking about yoga, the asana, the importance of pranayama. His English was not very good, so it was a bit difficult for us to follow because he would sometimes quote Sanskrit as well mm -hmm. and, and, and go into the sutras, Patanjali sutras, which was lovely. However, one, I think after about three months, we were talking about liberation, moksha, mm -hmm. in the tradition of it as we know it. You know, uh, freeing yourself from the entanglements of bondage, being able to be free from rebirth, etc. For me, that was something that was uh, from my readings of, uh, you know, spirituality, especially Indian philosophy. This is something that's attainable. And when we, I had asked, I asked him the question. I said, "Do you think that liberation is possible in this lifetime?" And he said to me, "In this, what we call the Kali Yuga, where." the degeneration of the samskaras and the living style, he said he doesn't believe it's possible. Oh, okay. Uh, he didn't believe that it's possible to have liberation. Within a lifetime, yeah. Within this lifetime and mm. in this kind of yuga. Mm. And I thought, well, what am I doing here? What am I spending three hours doing this intense training for and hammering myself every day if my teacher doesn't think that liberation is possible? And it made me have to reflect and it made me come back to that idea uh, of this subtle suggestion that I had earlier about wanting to find a spiritual teacher, mm. not just a yoga teacher. I never really looked at Patabi Joyce as some sort of guru. I mean, I wouldn't say that I didn't see him as a guru. He's a great teacher of yoga. Of course, of course. What he, what he, is, what he, what he taught on that level, he taught, he taught the Hatha Yoga, the Pranayama practices mm -hmm. exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. And he was fantastic at it. But he didn't seem to be coming from this higher level of someone from a high level of spiritual attainment giving the teachings. So you were looking for the ultimate uh, sort of evolution that you could undergo uh, on a spiritual level. And uh, you did, uh, I think uh, your teacher's words probably told you that perhaps this is not where I'm going to get it. Because if he doesn't believe that it's possible, you wanted to find out where it was possible. Correct. However, I think you might be painting my picture a little bit bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you just wanted to stay off the beer. <laughs> I would say that it wasn't so much that I was seeking really the heights of spirituality. Uh. I think I was seeking a way of trying to get myself out of the mess that I was in. Ah, okay, okay. I think that might be more realistic. Absolutely. I think most of us start at that point, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. So it was saying like, you know, I'm here, I'm in this life and I'm suffering and I have no clue what it's about. And I've, yeah, I've got no clue how I got into the state of suffering. I've got no idea of how I get out of the state of suffering. But I do know that there's this teaching that says you can get out of it. But that was books. Mm. So how do we go from the knowledge of that it's there to the experiencing of what can get us out of this mist that we got ourselves in? Because several years of practicing TM several years of practicing Hatha Yoga and Pranayama, extra, I still felt like I was still in the same kind of mess that I was when I started. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, some transitions and improvements are there, sure, no sure. doubt, and some refinements were there. And, and I physically, felt, obviously, and physic much physical, better. Physically, much, much better. And what I was capable of doing physically mm -hmm. I was, mm -hmm. was, was incredible. But, you know, a journey always has its moments of, or nature will say to you, okay, where do you want to go from here? 
And somehow it sort of either creates a difficult situation, which I found, I felt like here I was in the land of India, different languages, different belief systems, different uh, food habits, which were very strange for me and quite difficult. Of course, yeah. So I did get quite sick as well uh, to the time, to a moment where I thought I would even die while I was here in India mm. because I was so sick. Uh, and then not dying, <laughs> but then also knowing that, hey, you know, what am I really here for? Let's, and after Patabi said he didn't feel that liberation was possible, I wanted to, and I was coming towards the end of my session with him, I thought, let me go and find, if it's possible, can I find a, a guide who, who feels that is possible and can take me on that journey? Mm. So that was the, that moment. And so where all did your search take you after that then, after Mysore? Okay. So my first search was more local. Mm -hmm. around, within Mysore. Within Mysore, yeah. because I was still there training. I still mm -hmm. had a few weeks or a month left to go. And I visited and one or two ashrams. And of course, you'd visit the ashram and they'd do some homa, um, purification practices and uh, whatever. And, and I wanted to meet the guru who was there. And you'd see him in his beautiful orange robes, looking quite splendid, you know, with his beautiful beard, bit, you know, like this very guru kind of look. And then uh, going there again and asking the guru, uh, do you think it's possible to get liberation in this lifetime? And the answer was the same. Not in Kali Yuga. Not in Kali Yuga. We can only be here to be in praise of the Lord, to praise God and to be in, in, in this praising until the time changes that we can get liberation. And so that happened two or three times. Uh, uh, a friend of mine was, we decided that we would travel to Tiruvannamalai uh, to go and visit the Ramana, Rama, Ramana Mahashi uh, ashram there. I heard so much about, read about Raman, Ramana Mahashi. He passed away, I think, in 1950 sometime. Okay. Uh, but I heard so much about Tiruvannamalai and how a spiritual place that was. And I thought that would maybe be a nice place to visit. Of course. Maybe find some answer there. Of course. Uh, so we traveled on a bus and, you know, I don't know if you know, buses in India in those days were pretty tough. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, not, I think we had a wooden seat. Yeah, with blank no, for a Blank seat. seat. And you were there for several hours bumping around. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So by the time you actually got to the destination, it was... <laughs> Thank God you were a yogi. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. So we, it was a tough journey. And we arrived and we spent some time there. And it was, again, a nice place, and, and we walked around the hills. But Yeah, everyone talks about Arunachala, you know, the Arunch vibrations Arunachala, of the hills. Yes. Yeah. yeah, did you feel any of that? Did you feel a special energy there? Yes, there is a special energy there. There's no doubt about it. It's like if you come to Kana, there's a special energy, and there's definitely a special energy there. Hmm. And you feel it. However, as, um, Mah uh, as oh, not Maharishi, as, uh, Ramana, uh, Ramana had passed away, hmm. there was no living guru anymore. Mm -hmm. There was no... Uh, what would we say, the the leader mm. was no longer there. It was just a practice. Sure. And his sayings in books. And sayings something. in books, etc. And mm. there was a Mahasamadhi there of uh, Ramana, and mm. you'd go there and meditate. And I think the meditation was Aham Brahmasi, mm. that thou oh. art, mm. or I am that type of thing. You know, and if you don't have that, divinity within you, which I probably didn't have at that time. I couldn't experience it. I'm sort of, I'm only meditating on my own samskaras or, you know, my own inadequacies or whatever. And so I, I found that that didn't give me the, the real search as well. And when I was coming back from visiting the um, Ar Aranchula at school, Arunachala, it, uh, yeah. Arunachala. Yeah. I was feeling so desperate, so I don't know, I was thinking, I'm here in India. Is there really a path? Is there really a guru that, you know, and I was praying to God. I was crying. I was in tears. I was crying. I said, dear God, if there is a guru, a master of capacity, of capability who can guide me and take me to the path, can I please find him? So I think I had to get to that level of crying, of desperation, of, of asking God, May I find the teacher? And then it was probably within a few days after that, I went back to Mysore, started, was still doing my practice there. And then a sister came. She came from Chennai. She'd been with Chariji for 
a month and she came to do some training and I looked into her eyes and I said, what have you been doing? Because just her, her eyes, just the look in the eyes. Just the look in the eyes. Wow. And she said to me, oh, I've been practicing Saj Marg with, and, and the Charaji was there and getting sittings with him every day. And just to look at her and you, like, you know, Charaji would say, the eyes are the gateway to the soul. And when I was looking at her eyes, it's like I was looking at her soul. And I said to her, what have you been doing? You have to share with me what you've been doing because whatever it is, I want it. <laughs> I'll have what you're having. <laughs> yes, I want that. <laughs> and so she sort of explained to me about Saj Marg, as we called it in those days. And then she said that I will introduce you to the, one of the precept, preceptors there. And eventually I met the preceptor in Mysore. There was only one in those days. Uh, and he talked to me about it. And I went to his home and I seen the photos of the masters there. But I don't know, I had some uh, skeptical. Of course, because skeptical. you'd been on a search for so long. I've been long, on a search for so long. And you hadn't found what you're I hadn't found, for. but I didn't want to just think I'm just going to jump into this mm -hmm. without knowing a little bit more about sure. it. And though even though the preceptor was very nice and he said, this is how we do the practices. We meditate on the heart. There's cleaning. He even talked about the transmission. Didn't really make much sense to me at that moment. But I said, okay, it all sounds good. But I didn't start. What I did do, uh, and I'm a bit like Thomas the Doubter, <laughs> because I was doubting whatever they were saying, I decided instead of me doing my mantra meditation in the morning, since he told me you meditate on the heart, I didn't take a sitting, I just thought I'll do this meditation in the morning. So I took the divine light, and I meditated in the morning, my 20 minutes that I would normally devote to my mantra meditation, and I meditated like that. I didn't really feel any experience in the meditation it was the sunday it was our day off and normally on on that day off we would travel to there's a special hill in mysore called uh chamundi hill yeah chamundi hill there's yes. a special temple yes. there and the, the sunday a lot of people go there to worship and there's a market etc there so i was on my own i decided i would go to chamundi hill and just have a nice day up there and coming back to this talk about universal love which I'd never experienced, but knew that it was possible. Here I was, after doing this meditation on the heart for 20 minutes, was on a bus with only being, I was the only Westerner on the bus. I didn't understand language. Culture was very different. I don't know who anyone else was on that bus. But this subtle essence of feeling a connection to everyone on that bus as if they felt like my family. Wow. The first time I ever felt that. And I thought, where did this come from? And I felt that was my first experience of universal love. Hmm. It touched me so much. Wow. And that was my, just from meditating on the heart. I didn't take a sitting. I didn't get cleaning. I just did the meditation. That's incredible. Yeah. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. So then did you, did you kind of connect the dots and you said, okay, I did that. So should I go get a sitting? Absolutely. <laughs> I thought, well, that's what it's doing. <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah. Even though the sister looked fantastic and she looked very, very bright and everything, I still had to sort of, I think I had to do some little test. Of course, of course. You know, and of course the test was, or the experiment proved, yes. proved well. Uh, as Daji would say, you know, he says, you know, we, we, we're the laboratory, we're the experimenter. Absolutely. Uh, it was a, a successful test. Absolutely. And it sort of convinced me that, Okay, let's follow this and see what it can lead to. And uh, did the sittings kind of put the stamp on it that, yeah, this is... I would have to say that the three introductory sittings I didn't really feel mm -hmm. too much in. I don't know why. There's probably a lot of... Probably there was a lot of work happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't really feel that... Uh, it, it sort of didn't really put any real extra stamp on it. The first thing that put the first next stamp was I attended the first group meditation. And uh, where the preceptor lived, he had a small room, probably not much bigger than these cameras in this area that were around us. Oh, wow. It was very small. Mm. And we had roughly 20 people sitting in there. So it was a squat. Stuffed in, yeah. Stuffed in. So we were like sardines in this little room <laughs> and cross-legged on the floor, no cushions. Even though I was a yogi, that was, that was <laughs> going to be tough. And so I sat down. The preceptor it was his brother-in-law who was visiting. Uh, I can't remember where he's coming from, but he said, please start meditation. I started meditation. I think it was okay for about 15 minutes. 
Now, after 15 minutes, my legs started to pain. My sit bones were paining. I couldn't move my legs because if I moved my legs, whoever's in front of me, sure. I would be bumping. If sure. I tried to move my legs this way, I would be bumping. I can't, I can't move. I just have to stay still. And it was agonizing. Mm. I have to say that I was in the most a deep agony during that <laughs> most of that meditation. Uh, and then when he said, that's all, I thought, oh, fantastic. What that, a was, relief. <laughs> that was bliss. <laughs> I could move my legs. You know, and, and it was funny because I didn't meditate at all during the whole, the whole session. But again, after I came out, I went to meet some friends for dinner. And then I was like, I was in a different atmosphere. I was, I was present. I was sitting at a table eating dinner with people. But I felt like there was a heavenly atmosphere around me. Like I'm in a different world. Wow. This, is, this was unbelievable. I just couldn't, like, like it was something I could never even imagine you could experience. And there I was, and I was trying to think, hey, you guys, do you know that heaven is kind of, can be felt? And, and, and I was trying to say, I was trying to explain to them, I did this meditation, and I'm feeling mm. like I'm in this space, but they couldn't, they couldn't relate they to couldn't me. They couldn't understand. They couldn't understand. Yeah. yeah. You know, they were into their yoga practices and sure. things like that. Nice people, but, and I was trying to say to them, oh, I'm in this beautiful space, you should try and do it. You know, it's like, but they just did, couldn't really relate to what I was trying to say. And that sort of, that sort of stamped that, Heartfulness or Saraj Marg, as we call it in those days, natural path, was definitely something I wanted to, you know, go deeper into. Absolutely. And I was finishing up in about, I think that was probably around about the 2nd of May. And so I booked my flight from, uh, well, I was in Mysore, but I took the train from Mysore and I booked a flight from Bangalore flight fr to Chennai, or in Madras, as it was called in those days, to come and visit that, uh, Charaji. Mm hmm so I thought I want to come and visit the Guru now. Um, I feel this has got something very special to it. It's given me some very special experiences. And so I want to come and meet the Guru. And so I didn't even write to Charity to say I'm coming. I just said I'm going to come and show up. Yeah. And show up. You know, got my bag, got on the train, took a flight, arrived in Chennai. Didn't know, I didn't know where I was going to go to, but I, I knew that there was a bus that took us to near to his place and, and near to where he lived. And so from there, I took a little rickshaw to find out how to get to his place, and I arrived. Uh, at the time of arrival, Charaji was sleeping, so I didn't get to meet him, but some other brothers and sisters were there, and they just said, look, uh, Charaji's sleeping now. We'll come back in the afternoon. He goes for his walk at 4 o'clock. We'll get to meet him there. And I said, okay, that's good. So I went with them and f came back and... Uh, we met Charaji on his walk. Mm -hmm. And of course, I had in my head, you know, we all think big about ourselves. Uh, I had this, because uh, I had read books about when Swami Vivekananda, Swami Vivekananda met Went Ramakrishna. To, yes, yes. And he said, oh, oh you've you're come. here. You've come. <laughs> I've been waiting. <laughs> I've been waiting. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, you know, the guru is going to be waiting for me. <laughs> At you least know, he's going to. At least he's going to special acknowledgement. Special acknowledgement. Yes, yes. And so I got. So when we're on the walk, and one of the other brothers who was there said, "Oh, Charaji, this is John Smith from Australia. He's come here to meet you." And Charaji comes round. He looks. He goes, "Welcome." Turns away and starts walking. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, "Oh, that's a downer. <laughs> that's a downer. That was a downer." I thought, "Where's the big welcome and the oh, John, you're here. I've been waiting for you, kind of thing." <laughs> it wasn't there. Uh, and anyway, he went for his walk and and it was really strange because there was about 20 or so people following Charaji on his walk. And it was like, we feel like a bunch of sheep or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> bunch of sheep following the, the lion. And I felt very odd. In, yeah, you don't know the protocol. What I am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? And, yeah. you know, I just started chatting to some of the other people that there was a few people from overseas, mm -hmm. particularly France. And, you know, just started chatting with them and whatever and just having a bit of chit chat. You know, Charaji was walking, we just followed behind him, et cetera, et cetera. And then eventually, when we got back to Gayatri, where Charaji lived, uh, the satsang would be given. And so it was my first meditation with Charaji. We all sat down on the floor. Uh, in those days, Charaji also used to sit on the floor on his deer skin. I, I don't know if you've ever been to Gayatri, but yes, he yes. would sit cross-legged on the floor on the deer skin, and he would conduct the meditation. And uh, it was phenomenal because for me, it was, I just felt this connection into the heart space. 
mm-hmm. I felt this, you know, this divine love coming from the guru. And I was in tears and awe. And I just felt that I'm here. I'm at the feet of the master. I found what I'm here for. And I was only meant to stay one week mm-hmm. in Chennai. I was because my plan was to go to the Himalayas, and that was to continue with my search. search. Yes, yes, you know, because the Himalayas is the place yeah, you go if you're going to now go for finding enlightenment. And once I was there, I, I hear you were thought, diametrically opposite on the other on end. On the other it. end, yes. So <laughs> this is not the Himalayas. This is Chennai. This is hot and stinky, and not stinky, but it was stinky hot weather and yeah, sweaty. Sure. Uh, and you know, but there was the guru. You know, found it, found him, found the path, and just so overjoyed. There was, you can't you can't give words to such feelings. Absolutely. Of you know being in the presence of the one you've been looking to find guidance from, and the, there he is in front of you. And yeah, it was just beautiful. So, did your one week uh, plan work out, or did you cancel your further uh, travels? My one week in Chennai ended up being three months in Chennai. Wow! Wow! Yeah. And along with that, some travels with Charaji, uh, uh, you know, where he was traveling to. Oh, nice. Yeah, so very, very nice. Uh, it was, this is how I became a preceptor also. I can share. Oh, on that first you. trip. On that first trip, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I started, I took my first sitting, I think it was on the 2nd of May. Mm-hmm. I arrived at, at the feet of the master on the 12th of May uh, and was there and enjoying the sittings and whatever it was. It was the hottest time of the year. Very hot, mm. yeah. Uh, and one afternoon, the group of overseas uh, ABSEs who were there were, were going to leave. And so there was a lot of question and answer time with Charaji, who made himself very available, answered a lot of questions about the practice, etc. And a question by one of the ABSEs said, um, Charaji, we're going back to France or Germany, etc. Uh, what sort of company, whose company should we keep once we go back? And of course, Charaji said, oh, you should keep company with other Abiyasis. That's the best company you can keep when you go back to your country. And I'm thinking, well, there's no other Abiyasis in Australia. <laughs> so I pipe up with my little mousy voice and say, oh, Charaji, there's no Abiyasis in Australia. Who do I keep company with when I go back there? And um, so he says to me, oh, we'll make you a preceptor and you can make Abiyasis so you can keep company with some other Abiyasis over there. Oh, nice. Mm. Wow. But it didn't really hit me what he'd said at the time. It sort of sort of went over my head. Because I'd only been practicing for two weeks. Sure. I mean I'd only been meditating for two weeks in half in heartfulness. And so I it sort of I sort of it it almost like it went over my head and it I didn't think about it. Everyone had gone. And then one time we there was a traveling time where uh, Charaji was traveling to Calcutta. Uh, so I asked him if I could come. He said yes. Uh, on this flight that we were going to Calcutta with him, it was only two ABSEs and Charaji. Oh wow! So here we are on a flight with him going to Calcutta. I sit on one side of Charaji, and the other sister sits on the other side of Charaji. I mean, we nice. can't believe how lucky we were to be in such proximity of of the master at that time, and how now we realize how valuable that was. And you know, so we we, we fly to Calcutta, and this was a very interesting time for me because I'm still new, still adjusting to being with Charaji and, you know, but I'm, I've accepted everything. I was, unfortunately, when I'd arrived, I came down with very bad stomach pain. I was very ill and a lot of um, problem. And so when we arrived, I just wanted to lie down. And anyway, the, 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 the hosts had made beautiful food, beautiful display of fruit because we were all there and they went as, as their guests. And so I was lying down and Charaji came and said, look, food is ready, dinner's ready, can you please come and join us? And I said to Charaji, I said, Charaji, I can't, I'm so sick, I really can't eat. He said, no, no, you have to come. I was trying to get out of it, but he said, no, no, you have to come. So I went to the table and by the grace of him, I was sitting, he was at the main table, I was sitting next to him. I was feeling really awful, I mean, mm-hmm. physically awful. Charaji gets some papadam and he puts it on my plate. I eat the papadam and it was just like my my consciousness just went wow like that. Wow. It was like I just I, I was like floating out somewhere. Jerry gets another bit of papadam and he puts it on my plate. And I eat it. 
And it was like, oh, now I'm going even further. <laughs> I mean, I'm out of the house. I'm not even sitting in the, this unit anymore. I'm like, wow. my consciousness is just going somewhere. He takes again another bit of papa dum and he puts it on my plate. And I eat it. And the thought came to me, if he gives me one more piece of papa dum, I'm not going to survive. You're out of here. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> And he didn't give me he didn't give me any more puppet arm. I think it was good. I think he realized that, hey, I think I've taken him to where he can go. If I give him one more, he's, he's gonna disappear from this planet. And that's what I felt. It was amazing. The magic puppet arm. The magic puppet arm. Wow. I'll remember those puppet arms forever and ever. And then, and then and after, you felt okay. Yeah, and the other thing that he gave me, which was really weird, he says, Oh, Rasgula is good for tummy ache. Um, I, I come from like my background from then. I'm a macrobiotic person. Mm -hmm. I eat brown rice, vegetables with maybe a bit of pickles. I don't eat. No I, sugar. No nothing. sugar. Mm -hmm. No no sweets, okay? <laughs> I don't eat sweets. And if I'm sick... You, you I, couldn't get anything sweeter I than a rascula. I couldn't get anything sweeter than a rascula. And I'm thinking, how can rascula help you with stomach ache? Anyway, Chaoji gave me the rascula. I ate the rascula. And guess what? Your stomach ache's My gone. My stomach ache's gone. Yeah. But you know that I think actually that works because uh, we had a cocker spaniel once mm -hmm. and, um, you know, we used to give him chicken and we uh, the chicken was there and it was raw. Mm -hmm. and we were just going to cook it, but the cocker spaniel couldn't wait. And while we weren't in the kitchen, he jumped up on the counter and ate the raw chicken. And of course, he had a terrible stomach upset. And then the vet told us, just give him a rasgulla. And we were like... A dog, a rasgulla. He said, no, no, for the tummy, it's just perfect. And we gave the cocker spaniel a rasgulla and sure enough, he wow. was fine. So Amazing. maybe there's something in that rasgulla. You know? <laughs> <laughs> there's definitely something. I don't know whether it was in the, the intention or the sankalpa of the of, that, of Charji or the, the rasgulla itself. I'm not sure, but it worked. But uh, if anybody wants to try it out, what's the harm? Just keep eating rasgullas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasant, it's a pleasant medicine. Yes. It was a very pleasant medicine. Yeah. Yes. So then you, uh, did he make you a preceptor in uh, Kolkata? Yeah. So what happened is, uh, you know, this was probably a week after we have, he'd said, I'll make you a preceptor and you can, you know, make happy essays and you can keep company there. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, then that came back to me. It was in the subconscious. Mm -hmm. So in the subconscious, it came back to me and I started thinking about it. And I thought, oh, yeah, maybe I should accept what charity said and i think it was in calcutta and i said to him oh charity do you remember you said that uh, you would like to make me a preceptor and i can make some abs for keeping company he said okay good we'll start tonight wow, <laughs> uh, wow. and then my my preparation for being a preceptor started so wow i think it was you know roughly seven or eight sittings uh face to face with with charity in those days incredible yeah and uh every time i went there was just an incredible experience to get that you know, experience from him every time. Of course, of course. You know, one to one. Of course. And I remember in one of the sittings, it was another one to blow me away. He sat down, and I can't remember if it was the first or second meditation, and he said, please start meditation. And all I could feel was like, uh, you know, when they talk about paramanas, the divine, even if it's not so much the pranahuti, but it's the essence that's given from the guru. Because his whole subtle body is emanating, his physical body, his, anana, his uh, Ananamaya Kosha yeah. is emanating di divinity. All I could feel was like particles of Paramanas, divine particles. Wow. Just coming over my whole being. And wow. I, I'm just sitting there and I'm thinking, you, you know, when these things happen, you just can't, you can't fathom what to think or what to do. It's just such an experience that takes you into a different space altogether. And, you know, you're in awe of the master. Absolutely. You're in awe of what they're giving you. You know, and in Halfness and Saj Mark, it's for free. <laughs> you know, you're getting yeah. this yeah. You're getting this darshan. You're getting this most, you, you, what we call these experiences, they, whether you call them cosmic, universal, whatever they are, and yet we get them at, just because we're interested to, to know about spirituality. We're just mm. interested to have to, a willingness, to, a willingness to be in this path. Yeah. You know, and it's just, it is phenomenal. Mm. Mm. And then how was that journey as a, as a trainer? Did, do you remember the first sitting you gave? I do remember the first <laughs> sitting I gave. <laughs> we didn't get trained in those days as they get trained these yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was talking to Christine and she said uh, all Babuji <laughs> told her was just go do the work. Yes, yes. <laughs> that was pretty much all the instruction she had. That was pretty much it. I think we might have had, I think there was maybe 10 sheets of paper. Oh, okay. 
that talked about a little bit about what you kind of should do. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know whether I really read it or not, but anyway, yeah. because by the time I had a chance to read it, one of the other people at ABS, he said, were jumping on me saying, yeah. oh, can I get a sitting from it? You know, <laughs> okay. Because everyone seems to think there's a special sitting from the first time you give a Oh, yeah, a I, I heard that too. I heard that too. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, oh, it's the first one. The first one. You the know, first one is first one is special. supposed to be special. Hmm. So, of course, you don't know until you give it. Uh, and so someone had sort of jumped on me very quickly and said, oh, I want to get the first sitting. And so I said, okay. And, you know, sat down and closed my eyes. I had no idea what I was meant to be doing, really. You know, but then you just start to feel yeah. the, the effect that the transmission starts to flow from your heart to the other person's heart. And, you know, and then you're just thinking, oh, wow, this is awesome. You know, that here I am giving transmission. And then observing, and you start to observe the condition in the other person. You start to feel certain vibrations. You start to notice certain things happening and then you say okay well, let's start suggesting that that's being cleansed away mm. and it just sort of unfolds in front of your eyesight <laughs> well not your eyesight your closed eyesight it yes, just unfolds yes. in front of your in front of you as it's like you're perceiving something that something that i've never sort of perceived before yeah. so was there ever any sort of uh doubt that sometimes you may think that am i really doing this i, I am i capable of uh seeing this and uh, yeah Giving the, a sitting? Yeah, the first sitting seemed to be, uh, for some reason, I seemed to be able to get a good perception of things of what were going on. Mm-hmm. Counter to that, afterwards, maybe I started doubting myself and my cap- whatever capacity that, that the master had given me. And I started being that doubting Thomas and thinking, oh, I can't really read the condition. I can't really do this. Or I mean, the transmission would still be felt. But I started doubting my own capacity. And I remember one time going to Charaji saying, oh, you know, I can't really read the condition of the ABSE and I don't know if I'm really capable of the work. And he said, you know, Charaji was just like, don't worry, you've only been an ABSE for half of three weeks. <laughs> 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 don't, don't expect too much. You know, like one month, I'd been an ABSE for one, yeah. for one month. So he yeah. said, look, don't expect too much. You're just, you, you're hardly even into the system. Let, give a bit of time. You know, but the, the doubts were there. There were doubts there at times. And uh, and he was very supportive and very loving in his way of supporting you and whatever. Absolutely. You know, never took, and then he would sort of give you the confidence, you know. So true. Mm. So, so how long then did you stay on in India after that? Okay, I stayed until it was, I was meant to leave India, I think it was on the f- 20th of July. Okay. All right. And 2nd of May is the time you arrived in Chennai. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, 12th of May, I arrived in Chennai. 12th of May, okay. You yes, got May. your first sitting on the 2nd of May in Mysore. So, in Mysore, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 12th of May, I was in Chennai, uh, and then I was made a preceptor sometime in late June or something like that. I can't and remember. July, exactly. And then July, I was leaving back for Australia. And then there was all the talk about Charaji's 60th birthday celebration, 24th of July in Ahmedabad. Mm-hmm. This is the first celebration for Charaji as the master. They'd never celebrated before. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when I heard about that and my visa was running out on the 12th of July, I thought I went to Charaji. I said, Charaji, I want to be there for your birthday. He said, he just said, it'll happen. <laughs> you know, so I had to sort of, first of all, go to a, a, a GP. I said, um, I still had some issues with my tummy <laughs> problems. <laughs> So I said, I've got tummy problems. I can't get on the flight. I can't go. I Are you can't sure, sh- be sure not to stay off the rascullas just in case your tummy <laughs> became okay. Became okay again. So don't take any rascula. Let your tummy get bad again. Go to the, the, the doctor and he'll give me a prescription uh, and give me uh, a certificate to say I can't fly. Can't until, travel. Yeah. Can't travel. Uh, and then I had to get my visa. Except to Ahmedabad. Except you can to travel. Ahmedabad. <laughs> I can travel to Ahmedabad <laughs> up by plane. No, but actually we went by train, by the way. Didn't oh, okay. Fly. okay. So that was okay. But I can't fly back to Australia at that time because my tummy was too bad. I got my visa extended for three weeks. And then it was, it was such a beautiful time to be with Charji during that event of his 60th birthday celebration. Uh, honestly, I, again, another beautiful moment to mm. be there before I came back. Uh, and just another a way to sort of immerse myself into, uh, I would say, the sittings that we had during that event, I was just like, I was going into samadhi every wow. meditation. Wow. And there was one very embarrassing meditation that I'll share with you. Um, 
so you know we'd all, I'd be sitting cross-legged most of us were sitting cross-legged in those days we didn't use chairs chairs was not used in those days <laughs> not even by charity so we're all sitting someone sitting in front I'm sitting here and I, as soon as I close my eyes I've just my head would just fall wow. down like this and wow. I kept on bumping into the person in, in front, front of, of me yeah and, I, and I'd come up and I'd try to kick myself up and two minutes later or maybe I don't know but boom <laughs> and I'd fall on the person again yeah and then I did that and I happened a third time because I was just going in samadhi every time couldn't keep myself out of it and I thought my god if I fall in this person once again I think he's going to turn around and punch you me, know, punch me. <laughs> but you know people in India are super tolerant I tell you sure, sure it was almost like he was probably thinking oh lucky lucky person but watch my Australian language um lucky person <laughs> <laughs> A lucky person for him, and he was probably probably being ecstatic because I'm going into samadhi. You know, who knows? You know, but mm. yeah, he didn't say anything. He was very tolerant, super tolerant. Uh, but I was just I couldn't keep my myself from falling into samadhi and just wow. losing body consciousness each time. Incredible, mm. incredible. And then after the celebration, you're back to Australia. Back to Australia. That was the, the sort of the you know coming back to Australia was tough in some way um, because I'd sort of just left everything. Sure. Sure. Work, whatever I was planning to do. So you have to pick up the pieces again. I have again. to pick up the pieces again, yeah. Yeah. So there was a little bit of a struggle. And now you're also, did the did the physical distance from charity make a difference also? That you weren't, you weren't uh, having group meditations and stuff like that? Definitely. And I'd have to say that I sort of, even though I was doing my practice regularly, mm -hmm. I, was, I was, mainly because, because I had a, a discipline from doing the TM before in my yoga practice, I was a disciplined person so you were doing your own sadhana i was doing my own sadhana uh getting new people to join was the difficult part yeah and and you must have felt duty bound because as the young jedi sent out into the <laughs> yes <laughs> yes <laughs> you've got to go and make some abscesses and have some yes. company with some people i did have some good yoga friends uh mm. but they lived quite a distance i lived i came from the western suburbs and the western suburbs was more like we would say lower middle class uh area and so even spirituality in that area was even less thought about than other places. Of course. Uh, so I would have to travel all the way into the city and meet my other yogi friends. That's where I used to practice yoga. And I introduced several of them. Mm -hmm. So we would have our group meditation on a Sunday in the city. And I would travel all, uh, about an hour and 15 minutes to come in there. Uh, and we'd sit together and we'd start having group meditation. Wow. Mm. It must have been exciting when, you know, uh, from... One Abhyasi in Australia from John Smith, it becomes John Smith plus one or plus yeah, two. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't plus many, but it was a <laughs> half a dozen. Wow. And, and today there's still some of them there practicing. Incredible. Today, yeah. Incredible. Mm. But uh, there must have been many challenges too, I mean, because um, as you said, this thing is very new in Australia. Mm -hmm. It's not really, uh, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, and the Australian lifestyle is a very full lifestyle in the sense that it you, is. you're playing sports, you're working. Mm -hmm. There's very little time for anything else, actually. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, um, I, and you're spending your evenings at the pub. So mm -hmm. so it's a full day. Yeah. And how do you factor meditation in? Yeah. It, it was challenging because most people couldn't really understand what I was doing or what I was, why I was doing it. I even had a nephew who one time asked me, he said, what are you doing all this practice for? What are you doing all this meditation for? And the only answer I sort of could give him at the moment at that time was I said, what I'm doing is what most people are going to be doing in 100 years' time. Everyone will be doing it. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that might have sounded a bit pretentious. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what else to say to him, but that's what I sort of said to him. Yeah. Um, because w w when I said, because I, if I spoke to them about on the spiritual level, they didn't really sort of get the connection mm -hmm. about what was there because they didn't have that craving or they didn't have that sure, sure. That, that sort of wanting it. And unless you got that somehow craving mm. to be there, you know, you couldn't really get, get into it. Now, I did introduce both my sisters, of course. Oh, wow. Yes. That must have felt nice. Well, it the, was. I mean, they introduced you to meditation. They introduced you me introduced to meditation. You introduced them to yeah. so Sanchmark, which is. I, I did introduce both of them. One of my sisters didn't continue, mm -hmm. uh, my older sister. But my younger sister, she's a, been an ABSC now since, pretty much since then. Wow. Yeah. And she was also a TM meditator as well, as you know. And then uh, soon after, instead of having her photo of Maharishi, there was a photo of Chariji sitting on her table. and Lovely. Yeah. Lovely. Mm. But yeah, that is a challenge. I mean, do you think that there are people... 
I mean, some people just don't feel the need for spirituality, just don't feel the need to add mm -hmm. something to their lives. Yes. You yeah, know? Yeah. And I, as you mentioned, like when you were surfing, it was pretty much the, the flow state. I mm. mean, it, it was, uh, you can call it meditative. I mean, it's a very strenuous activity, but it's almost meditative, as you said, when you're riding yeah. the wave. Yeah, when you ride away, that, that, that flow state. So, um, you know, and uh, some people just get it from there. So, uh, was it... Uh, are there are there people who just don't need to do it? I don't know if there's if if people don't need to do it. I think people didn't either understand or know that this was really what they should be looking to connect for. Mm -hmm. They were finding their connection externally, and as you mentioned in Australia, it's a quite a full life. We got beautiful beaches, nice weather. Nature's been kind to Australia. Nature's been kind to Australia. We were a reasonably wealthy country. Mm -hmm. We were and, you know, and a small population and extreme amount of wealth extreme, makes yeah, everybody happy. Makes everybody happy, <laughs> you know. So why not just go to the pub and drink some beer and sure. stay happy? And you know, so I think there was this false identity of happiness mm. in Australia. And I think it's still there, mostly, because we still seem to have a low population compared to most countries. Sure, uh, and lots of natural lots resources, of natural resources, minerals, and yeah. all sorts of stuff. Although climate change is. Certainly yeah, it's playing its part. Playing yeah. its part. And mm. it's people's consciousness is starting to change. Uh, but it's by nature pushing mm. them. And, you know, I start, to, and, and not only that, it's been a little bit of a slow development, but you do perceive in Australia now, like in America, I would say, USA, that people's awareness is opening up a lot more. Mm. Uh, and people, a lot more people practicing yoga specifically because in Australia, people do seem to have a strong connection to the physicalness. Sure. Like sports, as you know, we're a big sporting country. You know, we recently just beat India in the... Yes, world. yes. You don't need to remind us of that. <laughs> I, I wanted to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> that was so heartbreaking it, because we won every single match going up to the final. I that know. Was, Unbelievable. Was the one we lost. I know. The one, the one that lost was the one that we needed to count the most. <laughs> yeah. I thought I'd just put that in there. Yeah. Well, the, after beating us in the test championship, of course. Or in the test in, championship. In England. In so. England. Yes, I know. It's terrible. <laughs> that is terrible. Uh, but, you know, we're a physical sporting country and it's and it's sort of been there ever since the time of um federation hmm. you know and of course every time ever since the time of federation we wanted to beat the palms at whatever we can yes, try and yes. beat them at it was the palms there was the the uh the america's cup the sailing the Amer oh yes, yes america's cup with bob hawk telling yeah, uh, everybody bob to hawk take a day and, off and uh was it alan bond who was the <laughs> yes, the, yes. The, the owner or captain of the yes the, yes and the, the, yeah that was legendary stuff oh man. legendary stuff yes and these are like these are like um in the history of the country, they're like the red letter days. You yes. know, they're, they're, they're yeah, yeah. Stuff that really matters. It, it, absolutely. Because Australia in those days was still trying to find its identity. And I think it still is trying to find its identity. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about Australia today is it's become very multicultural. In the day that I was growing up as a youngster, we had what was called the white Australia policy. Mm -hmm. That means if you weren't white, you couldn't migrate to Australia. Ah, okay. That was kind of what was there. Hmm. Now, I think it was in the 1970s that that changed. It was a great change to bring in place because then we started having uh, uh, immigration from various different cultures, be that from India. India specifically was one that started to migrate there. Uh, even some from Asian countries, uh, from uh, African countries. And so we've got this beautiful melting pot of cultures, which in Australia seems to work. We do seem to celebrate diversity in Australia. Absolutely, you know, and we and I, I I don't know where it came from. Maybe it was because you know we also took a land that wasn't we said was terra terras nullius, and that was incorrect. Of course, that was mm. a big lie. The mm. Aboriginal people were the original land. Yes, yes, and yes. We still have to we still have to deal with that uh, lie that that developed two hundred mm. and fifty years ago, and and make amends of that. And we're slowly coming into that. But because of that, I think there's also this acceptance of other people to come in. And so, f therefore, it's like, okay, whoever comes here is kind of welcome. And welcome to do their, whatever there is that they like to do, whether it be their faith, uh, whether they do their sports, their different things, their different cultures. And it's become a nice melting pot for like a, a, a universal country. Sure, sure. You know, without sure. saying that we're not, we're not. Even though we still are part of the Commonwealth and we still we still accept the king to be the king of our country, 
we we don't we're not we don't identify ourselves as being British, if that would make sense. Sure, sure. We're Australians. Yeah. yeah. And Australians is different. It's different in the way that we have an identity, and our identity is multicultural, and that's how we are. And we we accept we we sort of we not only do we accept it, we sort of um we sort of we're sort of joyous about it. We we find that that's something to be uh, celebrated. Wow, mm. that's so beautiful. Mm. That's so beautiful. So uh, going forward, what do you think are the uh, you know like the whole world says that they are going through a mental health crisis? Is that the case in Australia also? Because stress is a huge killer worldwide. You know, there are so many illnesses that uh, mm. are sort of uh, because of stress people are facing, and especially mental health is a mm. big talking point. But uh, in terms of Australia being such a such a blessed land in a way, you know, mm. natural beauty. Uh, so many opportunities to be outdoors. Do you think the, that Australia has fared better than the rest of the world in that scenario? I think in the sense that uh, we d- haven't had the sort of massive populations, we haven't had the same issues of survival that we've had to be challenged with. Like, let's, if we look at India, for instance, you know, on a day-to-day level, especially during British rule or whatever, a bit survival was tough. Yes, it wasn't guaranteed. It wasn't yeah. guaranteed. Yeah. And therefore, it was a tough life and it made them, but they also had a beautiful cultural background and they had a lot of faith and, and understanding and they used that to make them, to, to, to it was an asset for them mm-hmm. to be able to survive and to not, not just survive, but overcome it and therefore, and then have their sort of independence, etc., through their faith, non-violence. In Australia, we've had it kind of easy for a very long time, uh, but now we're finding that these things are becoming more and more difficult. Life is becoming a little bit more difficult, a little bit more challenging. Uh, and therefore, this mental health and well-being, as in America, is soaring. Mm. It's becoming an issue. Uh, whether that be in the, uh, in the uh, health field, uh, whether, whether it be in the uh, business field, corporate field, or whether it be in education, or just general lifestyle, mm-hmm. uh, there is an issue. And that issue has to be dealt with because if it's not, things such as suicide is increasing and that could be from highly academic people. It's not just people who are struggling on the lower level. Yeah, so it's not related to uh, yeah. economic means or anything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a little noise in the background there and I think it's my phone. Do we? No, no, that's okay. You can, you can answer your phone. Uh, you just need to switch it off. I do apologize. No, you can, you can answer it if you need to. There might be someone. No, it's an alarm. I was... <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not on? Oh, it's an alarm. What it's... was that? What's that alarm for? It's uh, your 130 beer, John? <laughs> yes, it is my 130 beer and I, I should get there. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, not yeah. a problem. Not a problem. Yeah. The, the, these mics don't pick it up though, you know, because it's oh, okay. Well, that's good. It's okay. Yeah, yeah that's not. Yeah. Right. So yeah. So yeah. This is becoming an issue, and you know, um, it it's it's a mental issue on the sense more of a social issue and and sort of the social um, IQ. Right now we have a, we talk about mental mm-hmm. IQ. We yes, there's a social yes. IQ. There's a spiritual spiritual IQ. So it's really the social IQ. I I believe in like places like Australia, which is causing a lot of suffering. People are suffering from loneliness. They feel isolated, even though, you know, we talk about being connected in the internet world and, you know, Facebook, Instagram. We say this is a connection, but they're not, what are they being connected to? It's not to another person. It's just media. And people seem to be lacking a real connection, even within their family, of, you know, having the proper connection we don't have this sort of social system like say is in india where your family you know, your extended family is there so if someone is suffering in the family everybody's suffering yeah it's therefore everybody's it's everybody's situation it's everybody's problem in the family and everybody does something about it in australia you start to suffer and i think that was partly my problem too as i was growing up was that i felt isolated mm-hmm. and in my suffering I didn't know who to talk to, who I could share it with, and in a way, it was a blessing, but it was also suffering. And it was, and I would say that there was also a social mental issue that I was going facing through my own upbringing that led me towards spirituality. 
Mm. And this is what we start to be, be, because people don't have this connection. They're not having a connection with themselves properly. There's not the deep connection within the family as what it could be, as what it should be. It's more like a material connection. Uh, and whether that be even in sports, like, oh, it's got to be a physical achievement. You've got to look good. There's the mm. body image image that's, you know, driving people crazy today because, oh, if I don't look like I've got a six pack and I've got yeah. muscles like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not good enough. Or if I don't look like uh, one of the models in the images that I'm seeing in the magazine as a female, I'm, I'm not good enough. And people are thinking that it's the physical uh, level of, of existence that is important when we know that in a spiritual level that's the least important. Yes, yes, yes. And also there's been the debate about uh, sports. I mean, love for sports is one thing. Yeah. But then love for winning taken to the extreme that you by any means necessary you need to win that that is something that especially in australia there's a debate raging that it, uh, you know do you play for the joy of the game or do you play it just to win mm. at all costs mm. no matter what mm. and uh, yes. you know, driving yeah. people hard yeah. Uh, yeah yeah so but do you think meditation in such circumstances could be something that more and more people turn to in australia i i think it will i think it's slowly moving towards that, that more and more people will do meditation, probably even yoga practices, um, that they, they start to see there's a benefit from there. Uh, and I do believe that as people struggle more and more with this um, social IQ that they're struggling with, mm -hmm. that they will start to seek, um, as I did, and they'll want to seek an, an answer because th the answer is not going to come through medicine. You know, taking a pill is not an answer. Mm -hmm. It's only suppressing the problem and it might deal with you, might help you to get to sleep for the night, but the long-term issue needs to be resolved. And there's only one way that we understand that really resolves that. And that's to connect with inside yourself and to have that spiritual connection, which also enlivens the social connection with inside yourself and, and within your community, whether that be just within, within your family or extended family or your community that sure. then gets nourished. Sure. So how easy has it been for you, John, to uh, be committed to your own personal practice without this large community that we have in India of people meditating? And it's generally, it's uh, easy to uh, find a group in India. Mm. So it must have been difficult to create a group. And uh, is it difficult to do it uh, in isolation? Initially, it was uh, because I didn't have a, a group around me to to, to do the practice, but I was quite fortunate that, you know, six months after coming back from my first visit to India, I was back to India again. Oh, nice. <laughs> and, you know, back, you know, to the feet of, of Charaji and practicing meditation and being around him and being in that, so that sort of environment. And also then having the blessing to go to uh, Kormet, which was the big stepping stone for the first preceptor seminar. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We've all read the transcriptions, the transcriptions. of Charaji's talks there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So being part of that. Yeah. Uh, and that, that, and, and just being part of that sort of learning process was, was really special. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. But yeah, it was very difficult in those first six months. Um, I sort of, you know, introduced a few people. We would meet regularly. We would be doing, uh, because we were such an, a distance away from each other, it was remote sittings. Mm -hmm. So I'd call them up on the phone, <laughs> say, Oh, are you ready to start meditation? Put the phone down. <laughs> You didn't, do the, you didn't do the flying doctor. We always read about the flying doctors of Australia who got on a plane and hopped out into the air. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. No, we didn't do the flying doctor, but we did do a lot of traveling in yeah. those days. Um, I was, you know, I think it was in well, a few years later that, um, you know, uh, I got married to Danielle, who's my partner. And, um, we, and then we both moved. We were in Sydney and we traveled around a lot of Sydney to introduce people. But once we moved to Brisbane and Queensland, we were the only two preceptors there. So did Daniel start meditation before marriage or after? Before. Before. Okay, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd have to say that she's been my sort of, what would I say, supportive mm -hmm. person. Um, and she's been a very dedicated person to spirituality and to, to the system. I would say even more than me, mm -hmm. uh, even though people seem to think I was, I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I seem to get the limelight, but she was really the one who was more and, and encouraged me. Hmm. If it wasn't for her, uh, some of the roles that I ended up taking up in within Huffman's, I don't think they would have uh, they wouldn't have developed. Um, you know, so I really had a strong pillar behind me, um, 
not just a master, but now a wife and, mm -hmm. a, and a, a partner in life who was supporting me and encouraging me to be involved uh, in heartfulness and to, to, and to go further. And we spent a lot of time traveling around Queensland to different places, introducing people, you know, trying to take up the, the work that was given to us. Uh, and we had two children as well. So, wow. we, we, you know, even from the time they were eight months, we were on the way traveling somewhere, giving sittings. Even when Danielle was um, pregnant, wow, she would be going and traveling somewhere and introducing people and giving sittings to people. You know, um, you know, and these days you get someone who becomes pregnant and they say, oh, I can't do any work. I've got to stay home. You know, in those days it was like we just went and did the work. Wow. There was no sort of – we didn't put any uh, – issue that would prevent us from doing it, especially Danielle. I mean, she was amazing. Lastly, John, I want to ask you that this, this whole journey of sadhana for mm -hmm. um, all of us, it's its never the same. It goes, uh, you know, it twists and turns and things like that. Mm. And sometimes uh, Daji calls it spiritual fatigue mm -hmm. or something. There's, there's times when it's or maybe there's just, just uh, people around you or something. You go through tough times and you start to question, am I, am I on the right path? Is this, is this really it for me? Yep. Have those moments ever happened for you and how do you get over them? Probably too many times. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we haven't delved into, isn't it? <laughs> that's, that's the part where it can be quite tough. Mm. It can be quite tough uh, on a path especially after you'd come back and felt that you'd found the path and the guru and everything else, then what happens when this doubt comes into your mind or for some reason you're not feeling that connection to the level that you had it before? And when I came back from my first departure from being with Charaji and then come back the second time, the first week that I was there, I felt no connection. I was hoping to feel that connection that I had before, all those beautiful experiences Beautiful moments. You want to I replicate that. that? I want to replicate. I, I come with the expectation that this is going to happen again. And it was like flat. No experience whatsoever. And I'm meditating and sitting and I'm and Charaji's there on the stage and giving satsang and I'm not feeling anything. I thought, is he really the guru? Am I still on the right path? Has something changed or something? What's gone wrong? And I don't know what it was. Luckily for me, after about a week, and I was really getting frustrated about and I'm thinking, oh, do I go and find something else to do? No, honestly, it was like yeah. that. You know, maybe it was just the master knows that something's going on and he puts a little seed back into you. And it was just like, okay, just accept whatever's going on. You're not going to get that same experience. Just take whatever's coming to be what's there. And as soon as I had that thought, then I started having experiences again. Wow. Like maybe not to the same level, but things were happening. Things started shift, and I started feeling this connection with the with the guru and the master and the work going on again. Mm. Mm. It's interesting because we I think we've all read that Babuji uh, spoke about spoke to Lalaji about mm. you know the final condition that he felt, and he felt it's nothing too great. So mm. Lalaji said, "Oh, I could take it away from you if you don't like it." And he <laughs> said, "No, please don't. I can't live without it." So, yes. yes. So there's also this plainness that comes in. That uh, mm. sometimes can be, you know, sometimes you can't figure out what it is, but mm. it's, but it's, but it's there, and you, you, you mistake it for nothing being there. But the thought of it not being there is un unacceptable. Uh, that happens often. And ha well, it ha often happen to me. I'm, I'm, of course, I'm not talking that I've got to that level of, of Babaji or anything like that. That's a very high state that he's talking about. Mm -hmm. But in the um, what we call, when we, we, we talk about the yatra, we talk about the journey, and we talk about the different uh, points and, and chakras that we go through. And at each point in each chakra, there's the, you know, the, the first of all, entering into the point, then there's the settling into the point, the merging of the point, and then there's the identicality. identicality. Mm. Now, when you're in the state of identicality, there's no more experience. It's like a flat state. Mm. So every point has that state of I'm not feeling something yeah, anymore. Yeah, it's just plain. It's just plain. But you've got to sit, you've got to be in that state for some time before you're ready to move into the next uh, part of the journey. But that's the most difficult part on the journey is sitting in that. It's like sitting at the airport waiting for the airplane to come <laughs> and take you off, you know, and yeah. sometimes the airplane gets delayed and you're sitting there and, you know, you're sort of wondering, oh, what's happening? Why am I not moving? You feel frustrated internally. 
you feel like somehow there's a the, the sort of the craving and that sort of wanting to be even with the master is not there mm. because a lot of all the a lot of this craving and a lot of this um pull comes from the master himself sometimes we think it's our own but it's actually i th- i believe stimulated a lot by the master and this is one of the another beautiful thing about heartfulness is that and babaji said that oh you know 1% of the work is in the meditation 99% of the work was all done by the the guru mm. by the master mm. and we we don't really know what that work is i mean we experience it to some level and there's a lot of the subtle work that goes on you know when we're moving into the points and we sit and we we're, we're sitting there it's almost like he then creates the right atmosphere for us to be able to go to the next point we don't i mean we we say that we're cooperating by we're doing our practice but it the real the real essence of everything is coming from him even the states the craving states i believe sort of somehow he creates them in us and then we we respond and then we can go to the next level so it's really by the grace of the teacher and the system that we move from whatever ever point we're at to get to the next point and you know and this is and this is also another part that comes happens is that we'll get into the state where oh i'm not feeling too good i'm not feeling like i'm moving progressing as fast as i'd like to or i'm not getting to this particular level and then you know we're lucky that we have enough money to be able to come back to india again and again mm. and then of course being here in kanha being here in even though we're not seeing daji every day or whatever but we get to have meditations with him he'll be very gracious and give us some time that he he will give us personally or you know we could spend an evening with him and that's the you know as we say the cherry on the cake and that creates again the environment for us to sort of reach out reach out and to, to want to wow. go forward again you know it's like oh yes this this inner beauty this splendor this grace this divine essence we feel once again and that just motivates us to want to be more and more involved <laughs> you know <laughs> absolutely we, we, it's not like i know you were talking about um fatigue and the fatigue will come but you know when we get replenished and we come back into kana and we come back to being daji's presence that fatigue goes pretty quickly <laughs> yeah you know and the fatigue goes and it's like I, i like for me now on this visit i just want to go back and do whatever i can absolutely ready to go you're like steve um, smith ready to yes yeah, steve smith ready to go again <laughs> <laughs> going in hit, hit another century <laughs> not against india hopefully no we'll do that against england <laughs> Well thank you so much John it's been such a pleasure thank you uh, uh it's absolutely been a joy we okay. could go on talking but we uh, could we could thank mm. you so much oh, thank you really it was nice to come and have a chat it's been lovely yeah thank you thank you for tuning into this episode of Kana Cast please follow and subscribe to Kana Cast on Spotify YouTube and Instagram until next time woof woof <laughs>